The following message is a presentation of the Sun Life Radio Network. Matthew seven thirteen and 14, two verses. These are very well-known verses. You've probably heard them said all of your life, but tonight we're going to study them. There's a difference between hearing something and assuming we understand the meaning of it and then studying something and finding out, you know what? We didn't really have the idea behind those verses, right? All this while, we've learned, listened to it. We maybe had a, an inkling of them, but we didn't quite yet understand them. And so tonight we'll try to teach and preach, if we can, these two verses, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus speaking says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And we want to talk in our study tonight about the subject, the way which leads to life, the way which leads to life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this facility. We thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the Sun Life Radio Network. But most of all, we thank you for your son Jesus, whom you sent 2,000 years ago to die on an old rugged cross that we might have life. And Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity tonight to speak your word, to teach your word, but we need the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we would ask, God, that you would anoint us to deliver your word and anoint those that sit under the sound of our voice, whether they be in this room or they be over the radio network or later by tape or even CD. Father, we ask that you would anoint them to receive, even as you anoint us to speak, And we'd ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Synoptic Gospels, give us the view of the life of Jesus. And as we view these passages tonight and we look into the life of the Master, we see him in the second section of his ministry. I divide his ministry of three years into three different sections, really because of the attitudes of the people and the actions and the activities that surrounded him during those times. The first year primarily was a year of inauguration. He was pointed to by John the Baptist, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the whole world. He was becoming known as a teacher, as a rabbi, as he traveled uh, in the arena of Judea, as he traveled uh, at the Feast of Cana and completed his first miracles. He, in fact, chose the disciples up in the arena of Capernaum. And they began to travel together, this little so-called ragtag band of people. But wherever they went and wherever they would go, things began to happen. Oh, hallelujah. Things began to occur. Things like the dead were raised and blinded eyes were opened. Tax collectors would get saved and changed. And demon-possessed would find themselves, instead of struggling under the power of demonic stronghold, would find themselves set free by the power of God. And it was God's way of inaugurating His Son into the ministry that had belonged to Him before the foundation of the world. And you know what? As this ministry began to unfold and as his voice began to be heard in the arenas of Galilee and in the arenas of Judea and in the arena, uh, if you will, of the Galilee ministry, uh, the people began to know him and began to flock to him and it was a year of inauguration. In the second year of his life, in the second year really not of his life but of his ministry, I refer to it as a time of popularity. Great 
massive crowds would seek him out and find him to the degree that he would have to move towards the seashore and have a boat to escape the crowd that if left on its own would practically run him over and trample him in an order to get to him, to touch him, to hear what he had to say. It was a time of great popularity. And the third year was a time of great opposition where the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the different religious leaders who had had the time to evaluate his person and his ministry and the things that he preached began to rise up against him and plot to kill him and try to find an error in his words, try to belittle him and try to berate him. Ultimately, his own preaching and his own teaching would cause many to turn away from his ministry. Uh, the disciples heard him say, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you can have no part in me. It was fine while they were being fed. It was fine while the multitudes were being healed. It was fine when the 5,000 were fed with the small loaves and fishes of a boy's lunch. But when it came to commitment, when it came to, you know what, this walk is going to cost you something. When it came to this is more than just church and being blessed. When it came to this is more than just having another house and another car and another pair of pants to put on. When it came to something that was eternal, something that was spiritual, something that would cost you something, the crowds began to disappear. The most anointed man that ever lived lost his audience in the year of opposition. Because people don't want to hear what Jesus really had to say. They want the blessing. They want the blessing. They want the blessing. But they don't want the blessor. They want what God can do, but they don't want a commitment to a living God that wants to come inside, take up residence within them, guide their every thought, guide their every activity, guide their every action, empower them to do His will and follow His purpose because people want their own thing. They want their own life. If God can be an addition... If God can be an add-on, if God can be a blessing to them, then they'll take him. But when God truly becomes God in a life, that's where we start to separate out the men from the boys, so to speak. Those that are serious from those who just want to be religious. And in Jesus' life's ministry work. The third year, and even on into the third and a half year of his life, his last year and a half of his life was a time frame of opposition. You've sensed it, haven't you? The same process happening in you. When you first got to be a Christian, boy, it was a time of inauguration. It was a time where going to church was great and, and, and everybody was excited about the changes that were going on in your life. It was a time of inauguration. And then you got together with everybody else that was a believer. And boy, it was a time of being, even though you were in a minority, it was a time of popularity. Man, it was a time... It was a time of joy. It was a time of great strength where you grabbed a little bit of help from your neighbor and, and you couldn't wait to get to church on Sunday morning and you couldn't wait to get on church on Sunday night and you ran to the prayer meeting and you took an extra class at the Bible college just because it was there. Hello? And you got involved in the things of God and you were singing in the choir. And you know what? You even helped out Mike with the, with the powerhouse. Hallelujah. And you did what you could during the radio thons. And it was a time of just popularity. It seemed like everybody was heading the same direction. Everything was going fine. And then. And then. That thing began to happen. That opposition began to come. 
you found out that living for God was not just as quite as easy as you thought it was through the year of inauguration and the time frame of popularity. You begin to find out that when you really make a commitment to live for God, you're going to lose some family. You're going to lose some friends. You might even lose a job or two. You might be pushed down. You might start to feel a little bit of pressure. Somebody ought to give me a witness here tonight. Because the truth is, when we really start living for the Lord, and we really start pushing our way in to the purpose of God in our life, opposition is going to come. Opposition is going to attack. Opposition from powers of darkness is going to move against you. And the same pattern that we see in the master's life will occur in our lives as well. We'll see that time of inauguration, a time of popularity. But then if you're really going to make it, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, you better expect it. Don't be upset and don't throw it off. Oh God, I'm in the wrong place. I got opposition. When opposition comes, get ready for a little opposition. In this world you shall have tribulation. Oh, Brother Larson, that's a bad confession. No, that's Bible, and it's not just Bible, it's red letter Bible. In this world, you shall have tribulation. You're going to go through a thing or two. You're going to encounter a little opposition. You're going to experience an obstacle or an obstacle, as they say in the South. You're going to experience something you never experienced before. Forces of darkness that are going to come against you and try to wipe you out, turn you down, shut you off, shut you up, and move you away from the purpose of God. But be of good cheer. Jesus said it, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Greater is he that is in you. I said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Christians get weary too quickly. Listen, my sister, Christians get weary too quickly. Every time that we have a little opposition, we go, ooh, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe God didn't really send me here. Maybe God really didn't. Because we sense a little opposition. And we get turned. Because the way to an easier path seems to just open up before us. My, that must be God. No opposition. Huh. That must be God. Everybody's doing it. That must be God. Everybody's getting along. Jesus, in the second year of his ministry gave us the greatest dissertation on kingdom living that you'll ever find in the Sermon on the Mount. He told us what kingdom living, those who were going to enter into the kingdom of heaven that he was proclaiming was at hand, what they would be like and what they would encounter and what they should expect and the character that would be formed and the processes of things that would happen. Three great chapters, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. We'd be here for five weeks if I tried to tell you what was in all of that. But you see the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the very spiritual condition that's required to have a relationship with God. In this section of Scripture, we see the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. And you've heard him say, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, you shouldn't even be angry. Because anger, uncontrolled, is the spirit behind murder. The letter of the law said, at least don't kill somebody. Well, you all came to church tonight, jumping up and down, saying, thank God I didn't kill anybody this week. No, you didn't do that. At least don't go that far, the law said. 
But Jesus said, no matter what she does to you, fellas, no matter how bad she treats you, <laughs> can't kill her. And if you were following the letter of the law, you could come to church if you didn't kill your wife. But if you were following the spirit of the law, anger that was inappropriate and out of control, ah, was condemned. He talked to us about watching over what we said about other people and judging other people in this great 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter. And the idea in the church today is, well, we can't judge. That means we can't evaluate. And I'm not here, but this is a sideline. That's not what it means at all. When Jesus says, judge not, lest you be judged, it indicates that we're putting other people down in order to elevate ourselves. We're putting the character and the person of somebody else lower so that we look better in the eyes of others. We're demeaning some so that we can shine. That's wrong. But in other passages of Scripture, the Bible demands that we evaluate all things. How else are you going to abstain from all appearance of evil if you don't judge it? How else are you going to evaluate what's being preached and whether or not somebody is a false prophet unless you evaluate it? So when Jesus says, judge not in this, these great dissertations, he's not talking about not being using the, the discernment that God gave you. 1 John 2 and 20 says, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. 1 John 2 and 27 says, you have no need that any man teach you. What? You don't need a teacher? That's not what it means. It means that inside of you, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit and He can guide you into what is right and what is wrong. So you don't have any man, you don't need to call me up in the middle of the night and say, Brother Larson, is that right? You don't need to call Brother Swigert in the middle of the night and say, Hey, can I listen to this or shall I listen to that? You have on the inside of you, come on somebody, you have on the inside of you the ability to tell and sense what is right and what is wrong. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and you are called by God to evaluate all things. I'm sick and tired of a body that says, oh, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. You're the only people on the face of the earth equipped to evaluate things properly. You got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I said you got the Holy Ghost. And you've got the truth of God's Word. As we follow them, we evaluate that. Jesus said, judge not in this great dissertation. Talking about the processes and attitudes and actions of kingdom living. Then he went on and he began to point out not just attitudes and actions of believers, but he came to, in our text tonight, Matthew chapter 7. And he'd been preaching about the character of those that would enter into the kingdom and the attitudes and the actions of those that would enter into the kingdom. But now he begins to delineate something that is very, very strong. And that is this. He's declaring that when we make the decision to move into the kingdom, that there's going to be the battle of the ages. And he looks at those around him on the mountainside who've been listening to him talk about the attributes of those in the kingdom. And he begins to tell them of the struggle in the spirit realm, not in the physical, maybe it'll include that some, but primarily in the spiritual realm, when you make a choice to live for God. And he says it in the Greek, it is an imperative, our first clause here, he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. It's not a request, it's a command. When Jesus said, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some have called it an invitation. Honey, it was an invitation. It was not an invitation. It was a command. You need to repent and do it now. 
He didn't, well, if you'd like to repent, press one. It was a command from the lips of the master. Repent. 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 And it's the same exhortation, the same strength, the same imperative tense of this word, enter. You're going to have to do this. This is not an option. Neither is it simple. Neither is it easy. You need to listen to what the Master said tonight, church. He said that the believer, that those that needed or desired to enter into the kingdom of heaven, were going to have to enter in, enter in. And the, and the admonition, the imperative, the command says there's no option available. You're going to have to do this. Get that in your thought process. Do what? I'm going to have to enter in at the straight gate. Well, what is the straight gate? Well, let's look first of all at the gate. The gate, we think of it as this little, you know, gate on the backyard fence that swings open and we take our bicycles to the backyard through it. But the gate that he's talking about here really indicates the door of a massive structure, much like the door of a city or perhaps the door leading into the temple. He said there's a door that we're going to have to enter. There's a specific door. And then he gave this adjective to it that it was a straight gate. And what does that mean? It has the connotation of being narrow or small, not in size the gate itself, but the passage through. In the Greek, it indicates that there are obstacles standing close about. Things are opposing the entrance into this gate. And Jesus said an imperative, not a request, a command. You're going to have to enter. You're going to have to get your game face on. You're going to have to set your face like a flint. You're going to have to understand that this is going to be uh, loaded up with obstacles that are standing close about that will try to stop you from moving in through the door obstacles. There is a entering then into the straight gate. And in the sense of salvation, I'm going to move this over a little bit and use this as an illustration. In the sense of salvation, I'm going to say that this is the door. And if you can imagine it in your mind's eye, imagine a door beam. And again, it's a smaller situation here, but this is a massive door. When he says enter in, And there's obstacles all around. As I go towards the door, I'm finding my pathway blocked by obstacles. It is not a simple thing. It is not an easy route. It is not just whistle on through the pathway. There's powers. This is the war of the worlds. This is the war for your soul. This is the war that it will end all wars. This is the war of the worlds. Your life is at stake. Your your existence is at stake. Your progenitory is at stake. Everything depends upon you making it through that door. And what happens is, as we push toward the door, as we push to enter into the straight gate, there are great forces that are opposing us. John the Baptist, or Jesus said again of John the Baptist, that since he was come and proclaimed his ministry, that the kingdom of heaven suffereth Violence. What does it mean to suffer violence? It indicates very clearly that the suffering of violence means that you're going to have to crowd yourself into something. You're going to have to be pressed into something. In other words, powers of darkness are placing obstacles from the door so that you won't go through it or so that you can't go through it. And at the same time, the world of men and the world of religion, as you try to struggle to get through that door, to enter in, as Christ said, is going to start to open up you other doors. Here on your left side is another door. A door of religion. Oh, you don't have to get saved by pushing in through a spiritual force. Just get baptized when you're a baby. In fact, you don't need to worry about all this spiritual warfare type of thing. All you have to do is be better than 
Bob or Sally or Sue, whoever who your neighbor is. Relative righteousness, it's another door. And going through this door, my goodness, there's no opposition whatsoever. And when I step through the door, I look around and there's a lot of people here. It's a pathway that leads to death, but there's a whole lot of people here. They're operating on the realm of religion. They're operating on the realm of trusting in self. And Jesus comes along and said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the life. And so in order to get saved, you're going to have to get your eyes off of the other ways that man says you can be saved. Relative righteousness. Be better than your neighbor. Be religious. Be baptized when you're a baby. Or just do the best you can. Every spoke leads to the center of the wheel. My Lord, those doors are off the one way, the path that God has established, and they'll lead you into the wide way of destruction, to the left or to the right, and you won't have any opposition there. It'll be easy to walk there. But when you see Christ and what He did for you, when you understand that it's Christ and Him crucified, in order to get saved, you're going to have to push through an obstacle. You're going to have to move on through everything that comes against you the powers of darkness come against you in a supernatural way and try to stop you from going through the door but if you'll keep your eyes on Christ and him crucified you're going to move through that door move through that opposition by the help and the power of the Holy Spirit and you move through the door wow Ooh, glory hallelujah Sin, and its debt is paid. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is here. I'm cleansed. I'm healed. I'm changed. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. My goodness, the penalty for sin is paid, and the power of sin is broken. My feet are on a path that's solid and paved with gold. But wait! Ahead of me, there's another door. The door to the eternal kingdom. I thought all of it was over once I got saved. Oh no, my friend. The door to the eternal kingdom. You pass through the door of salvation. And you're going to have to obstacle your way through. Huh, you like the way I said that? I'm getting broken into the south. It, you're going to have to push past the obstacles to get through. You're going to have to believe something that doesn't make sense. That a man 2,000 years ago on a cross outside of Jerusalem gave up his life. And when he did, he paid the debt for your sin. That sounds too good to believe. My friend, the only thing that is too good to believe, that sounds too good to believe, is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe it and go through the door of salvation. And we step into a new life in Christ Jesus. But the exhortation still remains. Enter ye in by the straight gate. It's not over once you get saved. Now we enter into the battle of sanctification and change and being used by God. And you know what? It's a narrow path. And uh, again, I see doorways leading off into wide, broad paths. And there's no opposition this way. I could, I could go this way and get off the path easy. And there's a lot of people on those paths. But on this path, as I look down at my feet, I see a path paved by the cross. I see the cross. It teaches me to be dependent upon what he did. And as I'm dependent on what he did, I find the grace of God, the strength of God flowing into me to help me in my journey to stay on the straight and narrow path. But as I travel along my Christian experience, I'll go by a few doorways. The doorway of psychology opens up and says, the Bible isn't quite sufficient to meet your need today, so let's take the advice of Sigmund Freud. 
I can't find the right superlative so uh, to express my thought. Let's void the word of God and let's trust what man says about healing man's inner id and being. And you know what? If I go that way, it sounds good. We added a few scriptures to it. I've opened my way through another door. And there's no obstacles guarding and stopping me from going through it. And as I step through, I look around, I see a lot of the church. Boy, they're on this path. This must be the way. Everybody that's important is here. It's a popular place. I keep on the path. And there's another door. A door of... Confess and possess. Sounds good. Whatever I need, whatever I want, I think I'll just meander on off the path here, this straight and narrow path. I think I'll just meander off the it, and I'll step out here onto this path. There's no obstacles stopping me as I go through the door. I don't have to crowd or push. I just proclaim I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And whatever I say, it will come my way because I have what I say, and I can possess it, I can confess it, and it will be mine. Well, you need to go back to the chapter that we didn't take time to study where Jesus said you can't have two masters. If, <laughs> if your master is what you possess, you're not following the one who wants to possess you. But there's a lot of people. Mix in a few Bible verses, and they've walked off the path. And they find themselves out here in a wilderness, and ultimately... They'll find themselves on the pathway to destruction. We have another path that opens up to us as we travel along the road where the cross is teaching us dependence upon what Christ has done for us. As the Holy Spirit continues to flow, here comes another opportunity, another door opens up. And this is the door of works. It's the door of faith in what we do in order to be what God wants us to be. Well, if we fast and if we pray and if we read our Bibles and we do everything right, we can in fact earn the power of God. And when you push through this door, there's no push to it. You just walk right through. Because that which sounds good has deceived us. And we have fallen for a system that God did not create. We have fallen for the system that says... I'm going to punch my religious time clock. I'm going to put two hours of prayer, an hour of Bible study, and four hours of church, and then I'm going to take my time card, which is now punched with that, and present it to God, and he's got to pay off. Because I've earned his power, and I've earned relationship with him. Now, we wouldn't say that, but that's exactly what we've done. We've placed our faith in what we do. And then we present our activity to God. And we say, God, you need to perform for me because look, look at my time clock. Check it out. You owe me eight hours this day or this week or whatever that is. And I need eight hours of miracles. I need eight hours of power. I need eight hours of strength. I need eight hours of you crushing my enemy under your toe. God, you owe it to me. I've done good. And that's how we get victory. And the believer that says, no, I understand my need to pray. I understand my need to read. I understand my need to go to church and study the Word. But I also understand that none of that affords me a relationship. What affords me a relationship is my faith in Christ and what He did for me at Calvary. And when my faith is there and I read and I see God's plan, my faith begins to mature. And as I trust in what Jesus did, the reciprocal flow of the Holy Spirit continues to empower me to stay on this path. But as I get closer and closer to the kingdom, closer and closer to the door, closer and closer to another level in God, the obstacles increase and the doors to the left and to the right beckon and call. And Jesus said, 
enter ye in at the straight gate. Keep your eyes on Christ and him crucified. Fight the fight of faith and muscle your way past every obstacle and opposition of the enemy that tries to cause you to veer to the left or to the right. Don't be fooled because if you go through the wrong door, you're going to look around and there's going to be a lot of people there. And it can even get a little discouraging when you're on the right path and you're looking around for some companionship and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of folk on the same path. But it's the right path. The devil will oppose it. But Jesus has given you a commandment to enter in by the straight gate. And once we've entered in by the straight gate, we are to ignore the gate that is wide, the gate that is broad, spacious, flat, smooth, no trouble to walk on it, no trouble to participate in that road. But it's a road that leads to destruction, a road that leads to damnation. And he says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. Well, I don't want the narrow way. What does it mean to be on a narrow way? It means to be afflicted, to suffer tribulation, to experience trouble in the sense of being pressed together. Well, this doesn't sound good. But it's as we travel that road and experience great opposition, we find a power that's far beyond anything we could manufacture, far beyond any religion. Victory over sin, the power to live right, the power to, be, to actually perform miracles lies within those who stay on the path. Or oh, we could run through the door of manifestation, but I don't want just manifestation. I want Him. I need to push through tonight. Say, Brother Larson, this is really simple. Yeah, I understand. But we've got to be careful that we remain on the way, the hadas, the path that leads to life. Zoe, life. God kind of life. This is what Jesus says when he says in verse 14, Narrow is the way, laden with opposition, laden with trouble which leads unto life, Zoe, God kind of life, life from the Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. As I fight the fight of faith and I stay with my faith on Christ and Him crucified, I experience the Zoe life of God. And He equips me to move through the obstacles. Equips me to move through the opposition. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And when the enemy comes and says, move to the left or to the right, having done all to stand, I stand in what my Lord has produced for me through the victory he gave me at the cross. Few there be that find it. Few. Few. How many is few? I don't know. It's really a contrast, not a number. Most people will go another way. Most of the church will wind up on a side road that leads to destruction, damnation, the eternal loss of their soul. But you, who understand the kingdom, who understand how to enter through the door of salvation and head through and to the door of the eternal kingdom on the straight and narrow path. You should know there's a battle ahead, but be of good cheer, for he's overcome the world, and he'll equip you to move through the obstacles 
And he'll equip you to recognize the false ways. David said, the psalmist said, I hate every false way. He's going to make the crooked paths straight. And the mountainous paths he's going to bring low. And the low paths he's going to bring up so that the path we travel on is supernaturally equipped for us to move where he wants us to move. What's our job? Fight the fight of faith. Keep your eyes on Christ and Him crucified. Enter in at the straight gate. It'll be a struggle. It'll be a battle. The battle that most of the church doesn't recognize. You're in. But the benefits, both now and eternally, you'll be glad you have. Would you stand with me tonight, please? Would you stand? I know it's a straight message, I know it's a simple message, but the gospel doesn't tell us about, oftentimes, things are complex. This is not a complex message, but it's a complex battle. And sometimes taking us back to the simplicity of what God has laid out before us will help us stay on the straight path, that narrow path. And I don't know what your situation is tonight. I don't know in what stage of Christianity you might find yourself in tonight, whether it's the stage of inauguration or popularity or opposition. But I just want to tell you tonight, stay on the straight and narrow path. Keep your eyes on Christ and Him crucified. Receive the effectual working of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God as you keep your faith on what God has done for you in Christ and the cross and the work therein. He'll empower you. He'll heal you when you need it. He'll supply your need when you need it. But you're going to have to fight the fight of faith and move from where you are to that next step towards the eternal kingdom. If you're listening to me tonight and you're in this building or you're over the Sun Life Radio Network and you'd say, Brother Larson, I've never even accepted Christ. Well, I'm here to tell you the invitation is open. You can enter through that door of salvation. But in order to enter into it, you have to trust in Christ and what he did for you at Calvary. And if you're a believer who's going through opposition, struggle and trials seem to be all that lies ahead of you, I'm here to tell you, There's a grace of God that will carry you through. You don't have to earn it. It will flow when you keep your eyes on Christ and Him crucified. And you'll find the strength to continue the journey. God's going to lead us to higher ground. I said He's going to lead us to higher ground. And we're going to take a lot of folk with us. It might seem few in comparison to those that are on the Broadway. But it will be worth every step. Every single step. Lord, lift me up. Lift me up. And let me stand by faith on earth. And stay the land. A higher plane. you come down and just worship with us for a minute and determine in your heart and in your life you're going to stay on that straight and narrow path you're going to keep your eyes on christ and him crucified and if you need some help tonight you need a little strength i want you to come and worship and pray and seek his face with other believers who will help you and strengthen you and stand with you as you walk along the pathway god has ordained Thank you for listening to this podcast presentation from the Sun Life Radio Network. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of people like you. To contribute to this work, please visit www.jsm.org or call 1-800-288-8350.